In this video, we're going to do a sunset seascape watercolour in 10 easy steps. Welcome back to my channel. On this channel, you will find all things watercolour and a little bit of colour mixing and mixed media too. If you are new here, first of all, please forgive the blank background. I've just moved house. Do also consider subscribing. I make one free video a week here on YouTube on a Thursday with extra content on Saturdays for my Patreon subscribers. So for today's tutorial, I'm going to take you through 10 steps of doing a watercolour painting. So this is a really simple tutorial. It's one that I did actually in real life with my Friday students a couple of weeks ago. In fact, I did it twice because I've got a morning class and then I've got an afternoon class. So I did the same tutorial and it had to be something that could be simply achieved within two hours. Now, I don't often do a paint along with my students. In other words, I don't get them to paint exactly the same as me every week, but we do this about once every six months. So I'm going to do it with you too, because I really think that it will work very well for YouTube and you can follow along, you can actually make the painting with me or you can just watch and get some tips. What I would advise if you want to do this painting is that you watch the video all the way through first of all to see where we're going with it and then I'll actually timestamp the video so then you'll be able to go back and pause the video between each timestamp and follow along with me. So let's get started on step one. So first of all, I'm going to show you the brushes, the paper and the paints that I will be using today. We're going to use my sort of formula for painting sunsets and that's three primaries plus a staining colour. Now, I'm going to be using the paint set that I designed for beginners. So this is my essential set by Jackman's Art Materials. So I worked alongside this British company to, um, to design these handmade watercolours and these are a set of basic paints. However, if you don't have these colours, that's fine. I'm going to give you alternatives and I guarantee there will be something in your box that you can use to paint this tutorial along with me. So let's get started and look first of all at the colours and the materials that we'll be using. So let's have a look at the materials we're going to use. So I've got a piece of paper here. Um, I've chosen a portrait rotation, but you could do this tutorial any way round. Um, just adjust if you want to do it square or landscape proportions. This is practice paper, so this is SAA practice paper. I'll level with you. I've only chosen this paper because um, I've just moved house. I can't find any other paper at the moment, but it's fine. SAA is a British brand. If you're looking for something similar, that would be something like Bockingford. Now, I'm going to be using some brushes, obviously. So I've got some brushes here. This brush um, I've had for years, and I use this for wetting the paper. Here's a flat brush that I use for painting with. And then I've got a couple of sizes of round brushes. These are synthetic ones. So these are the type of brushes we're going to be using for this tutorial. Standard flat and round watercolour brushes. So there's our brushes and our paper. If you'd like to learn how to stretch watercolour paper, I have got a video for you. I'll link to it in the information cards up above. If you can't see it there, do have a look in the video description. I'll pop it in there as well. Stretching watercolour paper is quick and easy and for a subject like this it's really really important because um, it stops your paper from sort of going crazy and going everywhere. If you're not going to stretch your paper at least use a block or at the very very least tape it down all the way around because we're going to use a lot of water and it will wrinkle and bubble up. So let's look at the paint colours we're going to use. So I've got some paints here. Now this is a paint set that I've just designed. These are my Essentials watercolours. I've got some swatches of them. So this is my Essentials set. It's got warm and cool primary colours and it's also got some earths and neutrals at the end there. I won't go through every colour. We're going to use four of them in this tutorial. If you don't have these, I'm going to give you alternatives, so don't worry. If you are interested in these, there's a link in the video description. So I've designed these paints that they can mix the widest range of, uh, of hues. And also there will be a colour mixing leaflet within each set that gives you a much wider range of mixes as well. And actually swatches mixes um, from these colours to make all the secondaries and neutrals that you need. So let's have a look at these colours. And incidentally, if you are um, watching this right after the video has come out, we are going to be taking pre-orders for this set. It's only just um, been put up live. It will be posted out in a couple of weeks. And with the first 20 sets, you get a few extra things, including a free brush and, and some other stuff. So um, if the video has just come out, you want to grab one of those, have a look in the description. If you're not interested in those and just want to know how to do the painting, let's go through the colours I'm going to use. And I'll give you alternatives that you may have in your own box if you don't have these particular colours. So we're going to use my method of, um, of doing sunset paintings, which is to use three primaries plus a staining colour. 
Now, if one of your three primaries, and it would most likely be the blue, is a staining colour, then you could paint the entire painting just with three colours. But I like four because it kind of gives me a, a bit more, a bit more flexibility. But it does keep us within that very narrow colour range because sunsets are bathed in the same light here, whether it's the land or the sea. It's all bathed in the same sort of light. So it's not as important which colour palette you use, but it is important that you use a limited palette and don't just chuck all sorts of different colours in there, which if you've got pan paints, the little blocks, especially a large set, it is very tempting just to go into multiple colours. So I'd like you to stick to a limited palette for this and I'm going to swatch each colour now and tell you the alternatives that you may have in your own palette. So the first thing you need is a yellow. So you can see my yellows here. Now I've got yellow ochre, this is an earth colour technically. I've also got these colours here. Now I don't want you to use yellow ochre even though it's a warm colour because um, this is not the best use for it in a sunset. It's a very granular colour across all brands and so it's better for things like um, sandy pathways and beaches and things like that. So we want a yellow that's going to be good for our sky as well. So you want a bit of a clearer yellow. So if you are looking at your yellows, you've got something like this. You want to be heading to these warm yellows, these orange yellows. So I'll swatch this one for you. And this one is called Daralide Yellow. And here it is. Now, if you don't have this colour, you can use something like a Cadmium Yellow Deep or even a Cadmium Yellow. Anything that's warmer than a lemon yellow will do for this tutorial. You could go as far as going into something like a, uh, a quinacridone gold. When I did the original tutorial with my Friday class, I used quinacridone gold. That's quite a nice colour. You might also have Indian yellow or something like the Winsor & Newton transparent yellow. So any of those warm, sunny yellows can be used for this tutorial. So let's look at the blue next. And I want you to choose a turquoise type of blue. So here I've got phthalo blue green shade. Now, people have been asking me in the comments why it's called green shade. Um, it's simply that the phthalo pigments come in a range and some of them tend towards the green yellow end of the spectrum, which would be turquoise. And these are called green shade. And some of them tend towards the warmer red end of the spectrum. And those would be called red shade. So they're a little bit more towards the, uh, the purple side. Doesn't mean that the paint itself is green. You do get phthalo green, but that's a whole other conversation. Let's not confuse ourselves. So I want you to choose a turquoise based um, blue like this one. So you might have phthalo blue. You can use Prussian blue. You'll get a little bit of a duller, different result, but that's fine. And you could also use something like a manganese blue, or you could use cerulean blue. That will work too. Those colors, those two colors, are a little bit lighter, so you might need to use them a bit stronger. So after your warm yellow, you want to choose a turquoise based blue. So let's look at our red next, and I want you to choose a pink based red. So I've got this one here. This is Permanent Rose. It's a really beautiful, bright color. So I want you to choose a pink. Now you might have Permanent Rose. You might have something like a Madder color. You might have Alizarin Crimson. If you've got a choice, I would choose the rose above the alizarin because alizarin can be a little bit of a muddy colour. However, if that's all you've got, that will work fine as well. You just get a slightly different result to me. You might also have a quinacridone pink or an opera pink. So now we've got all three primaries. We can mix purples, greens, browns, greys, oranges. We've got a whole load of colours that we can mix here and they're all going to remain within that same colour palette. For your fourth colour, I want you to choose a staining colour. You've got a lot of variety here. I'm going to use this, which is Payne's Grey. So let's swatch this one. But actually, you don't have to choose a grey. You could choose any staining colour. So you could use something like indigo. Um, not technically a staining colour, but you could use burnt umber or you could use sepia. Even Prussian, if you haven't used it already in your first choices, so your staining colour is likely to be a blue, a brown or a grey. You could even use something like a permanent blue violet. Just make sure it's a really strong colour, not something weaker like a raw umber. We need something with a lot of colour strength because you have no light in sunset without your darks. So next we're going to do our drawing. Now even if you are completely new to drawing, you will be able to do this. It's the simplest thing in the world. All we're going to do is draw a little sun in the sky. We're going to draw a horizon line for the water. We're going to draw a line where the water and the beach meet and we're going to draw a few rocks and that's it. So let me show you how it's done. So let's do our drawing now. 
First of all we're going to put a horizon line in and I want it to be above halfway up the paper because we're going to have a lot of stuff going on in the foreground. So I'm going to get a, uh, another piece of paper. This is just some samples I used from my last YouTube video. What I want is, uh, is a square horizon line. So in other words, I want it to be at right angles to the side of the paper. Now I could use a set square if I hadn't just moved house and studio and all my stuff wasn't in boxes. But if you haven't got a set square to hand, any piece of paper, like a piece of printer paper will do. I don't want you to draw along it as such because that gives a very false line. But I don't want your water to slope either because we're painting still water and it's really not going to work if it slopes. You know, it will be defying the laws of physics. So all I'm going to do is make some little dots along here. And this enables me to draw my horizon line by hand and yet not go off sideways. So if you find that you're always on a slope with your lines, but you don't want to use a ruler, this is the answer, is just to make some little dots like this. So once I've got those, uh, those dots at a right angle, I can then just join up by hand. So I'm just going to go along here. So I get a nice hand-drawn line, but I don't have to worry that I'm going off all in a slant. Next up I want to put a sun in the sky and I've got a button I'm going to draw in. So I want this nice circular sun low down in the sky like this. I'm just going to place it roughly in the middle and draw around it. You could of course draw this freehand but I do find that with you know with a sun that's setting there is a lot of symmetry to it. So um, you know a button will do. I actually have a stencil that's full of little circles. That's what I would normally use if I knew where it was. You can also use a coin, of course, that works well too, or even something like a pen lid and get a circle in the middle of your sky. Now we're going to draw our coastline here where the, uh, where the sea stops and I'm going to sort of draw up in a slight slope like this. So I'm going sloping up from one side to the other, trying to get this looking rather realistic and keep those lines, you know, even where you make curves, keep them fairly horizontal. You don't want to be doing a big curve like this or like this because it tends not to look very flat. We want this to lay flat in the landscape. So this is going to be where the edge of the uh, of the water meets. And I'm going to do actually another line here. And we're going to have a little bit of um, of darker sand towards the front as if it may be in, uh, in shadow. So I'm just going to put a little bit of a darker line up here. Get that on a bit more of a slope, I think. And finally, I'm going to draw a few rocks both at the shoreline here and further towards me. Now when you draw rocks like this, it's quite important that you draw them fairly flat at the base because obviously they would be you know, partially submerged in the water perhaps or in the sand. And so they need to be flat. They need to be wider than they are deep as well. If you draw them as perfect circles or circular type shapes, they're gonna stand up and they're not gonna look like they're laying flat in the landscape. As you come further forward, it's really important that you get some larger ones, perhaps like this again, flattening off the base. And although obviously rocks could be of any size, we want to roughly get an idea that they're going a bit smaller as they go away from us into the distance. You can actually, you know, you can put some little ones like this. You can actually make some kind of diagonals so that they are leading the eye into the picture as well like this. So I want you to draw a few rocks and I often like to bring one in just from the side like this. You never want to make it look like it's unnatural so obviously there would be some that just go outside of the picture and that's fine too. So we're just going to have a few rocks in the foreground of our picture and that's as much drawing as we need to do. So for our next step, we're going to apply the tiniest amount of masking fluid to the sun so that it can remain white while we place the sky colours in. Now don't panic if you don't have any masking fluid. I'm going to give you some alternatives. So for this next step, we're going to mask out the sun because we're going to want to keep it white whilst we apply all of the colours around it so it really glows at the end. I've got some schminky masking fluid here. If you don't own any masking fluid, what you can do is either get some masking tape and you can just draw a circle on the back of it and cut it to shape and fit it on. If you do use masking tape, you want to stick it to your clothing a little bit first so that you get rid of at least 50% of the sticky because it can tear your paper otherwise. Another type of tape you can use is Scotch Guard tape and you can put that straight on. Again, draw on the back of it and then cut it out with a pair of scissors and stick it down. Doesn't matter if it's not, you know, not absolutely perfect as long as it's roughly the same size. 
but I'm going to use this masking fluid and this is liquid rubber and I'm going to apply it with this item here which is a ruling pen and the reason I use this is unless you are very very careful this stuff can ruin your brushes of course there are ways of using brushes some people dip them in soap first but I just like to use a ruling pen I just find it easy to apply I've tried lots of different tools you can also use things like color shaper tools I've got one lying here these are these rubber tip tools that they sometimes use for blending pastels you could use one of those as well but uh, I tend to just stick to my ruling pen and you're going to just apply that masking fluid or tape across your sun. Now if you're using tape you can go straight onto the next stage. If you're using masking fluid you're going to need to allow it to dry and this will take about five to ten minutes. You should see it subtly change especially if you've got one of the coloured ones it maybe goes slightly darker. It will still remain tacky because it's liquid rubber so it's always got that rubbery feel to it but it should actually be dry so that it won't come off on your brush when you take your sky paint across. So let's start applying our first layer of paint. We're going to be applying the warm colours first. So I always do this in sunsets. If there's red, orange, yellow, pink, those are the colours that I apply first and then I apply the blues later on. Now there's two reasons for this. One is that if you um, put the blues on first, it's easy just to lose that light area in the sky and to not leave enough room for your yellows and your pinks and your oranges. The second reason is that it's really important that we keep blue away from yellow and that we don't let them overlap and so we don't end up with green. I'll explain more about the colour mixes that can make that happen as we go along. And I know some of you are going to say, well, you know, what about northern lights? What about the green flash at sunset and all of these things? But those are very, very rare things. Of course, if you're painting the northern lights, you might have some green in the sky. But pretty much at all other times, you want to avoid getting green in your sky. We're also going to drop these warm colours into the water because it's important that the water reflects the sky. So let's do our first painting stage. So what we're going to do here is we're going to wet the paper with clean water right the way from top to bottom. I actually have to work on a slight um, slope because of the filming arrangement I've got going on here, but I strongly suggest you do this with your board completely flat. Easels really don't help watercolour painting very much. They're okay for drawing, but um, when you start your painting, you want to tip your board pretty much flat. So I'm gonna dry my brush a bit. I want this, uh, this painting soaked but I don't want it to be dripping wet and you also don't want to go across it too many times. You start to remove the sizing, which is the coating from the paper. I'm also going to take a cloth around the edge or some tissue around the edge there, just so there are no puddles. And then without waiting, I'm going straight in with clean paint and I'm going to put the yellow in. So we're going across this bottom part of the horizon here like this. You can see I'm not adding much water to this paint. I want to go in sticky. Whether you've got tuber pan paint, it doesn't matter. You want to go in nice and sticky. I'm going quite strong here around this sun because otherwise nothing will show when I take the, uh, the masking fluid off. I'm just going to go up like that. I'm also going to come down into the centre part of the water here a little bit. I'm actually as well going to take a bit of this down into the beginning of the sand here. Now, I will be adjusting the sand so it's a bit more of a realistic colour, but I just want a bit of brightness there near the edge of the water, so we'll take that in like that. And then all I'm going to do now is get a little bit of pink in. If you're really quick with this, as soon as it starts drying, you need to stop. So I'm going to take a little bit of pink along the top here. It's a little bit strong, so I'm just going to clean my brush, dry it, and start sweeping that out. I'm just going to change to a flat brush so that I can spread this a little bit better. The reason for the pink, apart from the fact that it looks good in a sunset, is that it'll give a little bit of a barrier, and so where the blue overlaps it, we won't end up getting green. Just gonna even out those water levels there because the paint is starting to dry now. Just make sure we haven't got any hard edges there. And then I'm going to take the paper and clean up around the edges so there's no puddles sitting under the edge of the tape. That's really important. Once you get started, you need to make sure you've got everything to hand so you can work quickly. This is the first stage, now we're going to let it dry. So we're going to get on and start applying those darker colours now, including blues. 
It's really important at this stage that your work is dry. It's easy to watch a video like this and one clip goes straight in from the next and to think that the person making the painting has perhaps allowed five minutes to dry. When I say your first layer of paint and water needs to be dry, I mean bone dry, I mean completely dry. If you have to put it near a radiator and go away for now, then do that. Um, this is a mistake that beginners make again and again is not leaving enough time between layers and letting them dry. Now you might consider thinking, well, you know, we're just re-wetting the same areas before. Why does it matter, you know, to let it dry in between? Well, one of the reasons is that because it will set that first layer of paint and pigment into the paper so that when we apply water on top, it really doesn't move as much as it would do otherwise if we were working into wet paint. So this is the reason why you need to let the layers dry. And if at any stage further on in this video that I tell you to let something dry, I mean completely dry. Um, quite often I walk around my classes and people say, well, you know, I thought it was dry, so I just put that little bit of paint, you know, and it's all bled everywhere. So if I say dry, make sure everything's dry. And we're going to get on now and apply those darker blues. We're also gonna keep that pink on hand because it's important that our blue remains warm because we are, after all, painting a sunset. So now that that's dry, we're going to re-wet and we're gonna go in with some blue. And I've still got the pink to hand as well so that the blue tends a little bit towards purple. It's gonna stop us accidentally getting green anywhere. Now, rather than start wetting here and going up and possibly spreading this up, I'm gonna go the other way and start from the top and work down like this. I'm going to re-wet all the way almost to the shoreline, but not to the bottom of the paper because we'll just be working in this top part but we want to make sure that we don't go off the water anywhere then we start getting hard edges again i'm just going to dry my brush if i need to and sweep around and then straight away i'm going to go in with this brush here now it's possible if you want to you can when you're doing your own work you can pre-mix this blue so you've got a bit of pink in it I am um, going to be a bit more uh, hedonistic than that and just chuck things straight on but I do understand if you want to do that in advance if you're a beginner it might be helpful to you I'm just going to come down here and overlap like this I'm going to stay off of that area where the yellow is and I'm also going to come down into the C area and we're not going to go too dark here because this is just the first layer of the C we want this bit to be quite light so I'm almost going into purple there and again I'm sweeping in here and staying mostly away from that yellow. If I go over it a little bit it won't matter. You can get a little bit of the pink straight in there as well because we're almost sort of mirroring what's going on in the sky. See we've got this bleeding going on here. We can easily get rid of that just by drying the brush and sweeping a little bit of the liquid out like this. Keeping it as I said fairly light because this is going to be the area that's the sparkle on the water. However, I'm now going to go back into the sky and go darker at the top and a bit more purple too because this will more or less be the last layer on the sky. We could, if we want to, I'm going to change to a flat brush there actually, just starting to dry. I don't want to get those drying lines in there. We can later on adjust the sky further if it's not dark enough. But I want you to be really brave here and go really quite strong at the top there. The thing with sunsets is they only glow light when you get enough dark on them. So I'm going fairly purple up here now. And at this stage, I'm going to let it dry again. So for our next step, we're going to be using some candle wax. And our candle wax is transparent, unlike oil pastels. So it's going to show the layer of paint underneath. Again, your work needs to be dry at this stage. And we're going to use the candle wax to make that sparkle on the water. And we're actually going to reserve those light pink and blue colors that we put in the water earlier on. If you haven't done this technique, it is worth trying it out on a scrap of paper first. It can be a little bit tricky, but it's so, so effective. I think you're really going to enjoy it. So I've moved my painting off to one side and I'm going to show you the technique we're going to be using next. I'm going to get you to apply candle wax to your paper. So this is literally just a household candle. This one's rather short because I've been using it for quite a few years. So um, candle wax is transparent and we're going to use it as a wax resist technique. So um, what you do basically is you rub it on your paper like so. And you want to be aware that it's going to have a different result on every type of paper depending on the texture of the paper so if you haven't used this before I really want you to try it out first it isn't really um, completely controllable but it does give a great effect so 
what's going to happen is the candle wax is going to hit the top of the paper and yet the little bumps in the paper are not going to get the wax. So you can see how you get this lovely sparkly water effect. At this stage, if you're enjoying this tutorial and getting some value from it, can I ask you for a favour please? Could you please click the like button? YouTube rewards audience interaction, so if you like, share, subscribe or leave me a comment, YouTube will help my channel to grow. I'm almost at 20,000 subscribers. I'm so grateful to all of you. You can help me to get there just by clicking the like button. Now this here is a scrap of paper. This may be different to the paper I'm working with, which is a little smoother. The smoother the paper, the more of the wax it's going to pick up. It's really important that you apply your wax horizontally like this because always with landscapes and seascapes you're trying to get back to horizontal to make people think they're looking at a landscape. Now if you just scribble roughly like this you are going to regret it so let me show you what happens then. So what I'm saying is the manner in which you apply the candle wax is important because it's not going to look very realistic if you uh, if you just scribble randomly you can see like that of course that might be useful for waves and things but we're doing flat water in this case i do want you to try this out simply because it's hard to say how much of the wax you should place on your paper you might be surprised how much you need to put on i'm going to show you now how to place it on your actual painting and then we're going to come back and do the uh, the painting stage later on now in that sample I just showed you, we placed the wax on and it reserved the white paper. But here's the cool thing about candle wax, as opposed to things like oil pastels, candle wax is transparent. So we're going to rub it on the paper and we're going to reserve these areas of colour that we've made. And when we put dark colour on top later on, it's going to show these up, it's going to look fantastic. As I said, it's not always completely controllable, so do be careful with it. Um, but you know, what's life without a little risk taking? So I'm going to start putting the candle wax on. I'm going to concentrate a lot of it in the centre here, underneath the, uh, the sun, because we really want that brightness there. So I'm going to take quite a lot here. And then I am also going to take some further across. Keeping these marks horizontal. Although you can't see the candle wax, it is possible if you, you know, if you tip your board slightly, it is possible to look at it in the light and see how much you've applied. So I'm going to get on now and apply some of this to my water. You will find that um, it doesn't come off again, you know, there are certain techniques you can use irons and things, but um, really pretty much what you place on there is what's left. So I'm going to get on and continue putting a little bit more on this. We'll be painting on top of this part later on, so don't put your dark on yet. For now, just place your candle wax on and do make sure you're on that dry paper. Next, we're going to leave the water and the sky alone for a little while and start painting the sand. Now, if we put our yellow straight on as it is, it will be far too bright. I tend to call these banana beaches. I'm going to show you how to adjust your yellow just to dull it down a little bit so that it's the perfect colour for sand. So before we go back to the water, what I'm going to do is paint some of the sand. Now we're going to stay within this limited palette, but if I use this yellow, it's going to be much too bright. I've got a little bit of it on here already um, and going up into the uh, where the water overlaps. So I'm going to adjust this colour and we're going to stay within the limited palette. So I'm going to get some of this like so, and then I'm going to start adding a little bit of other colours to it just to dull it down. Now the opposite of yellow is purple, so what we're going to do is add tiny bits of pink and blue to it just to cool it down a bit. And I mean tiny bits, so a little bit of pink, of pink, and a little bit of blue. Can you see it's gone green? That means we need much more pink, and now it's going quite dark, so we need more water and more yellow. So you can just adjust until you get the right shade and of course do remember to try your colours out. That's a little bit dark so I'm just going to water it down a little bit. It's also perhaps a little bit strong but I think this is just going to be fine for our first layer because we're going to put some darker paint towards the front of the painting too. So a little bit more water in it and then I'm going to take it across this area here. I'm also going to soften this edge with clean water because this would be naturally being overlapped by the sea so I don't want a hard drying line here. 
You could pre-wet that, of course, or you can just sweep out with a clean brush like I'm doing. If you are using a clean, damp brush, make sure it's a nice wide one. We keep this leading edge wet so that we don't get any harsh drying lines. Just sweeping out with a dry brush there so that we don't get a line where the water stops because water alone, even clean water, can leave a drying line. So I'm going to let this layer dry and then we'll put another layer on the sand. So the sand's dry now and I'm going to put a darker area of, uh, of sand across the front. Now you'll notice I'm going across where we've uh, drawn the rocks and that's because they're going to go on at the end much darker so we don't have to worry about going across them now. So all you can do is mix up more of the sand colour and just go a little darker with it. So you can either use that initial mix I gave you with the, uh, the yellow, the blue and the red or you can use the yellow, put some Payne's grey in it, it'll go slightly greenish and then you just knock it back with a little bit of the pink because that's the opposite to green. So it doesn't matter which of those mixes you use, you just want to mix a darker version now of your sand colour. So again I'm going to swatch this colour and there we see it's darker than the initial colour but you don't want to go so dark that the rocks don't show up later on. So I'm going to place that colour across the front now and rather than pre-wet we're going for more of a uh, more of a hard edge this time because I, I want it to be almost like there's a shadow there and you need to keep the edge of this area of paint moving the whole time that you're going along so that you don't get any weird looking drying marks there and always keeping your marks horizontal so that if you do happen to get some kind of mark then at least it will be drying in a horizontal manner and won't be some weird sort of you know, upright shape that doesn't look at all like it's sitting flat in a landscape. So I'm just taking that across on the dry paint now. Putting an area of dark or shadow across the front of your painting like this when it's a landscape can help to keep the eye within the painting. So we're going back to the water now. Now for that wax resist technique to have worked, we need to put dark paint on top of it. It won't show up unless we put darks around it. So sometimes people say to me, well, I tried that resist technique and it really didn't show up at all. Often it's just a case of putting a darker layer of paint on. Now there will be an opportunity at the end of this painting to adjust. So if there's any areas that you haven't made dark enough, you'll be able to adjust them then. But for now, we just wanna go on top with a darker color. Let me show you how it's done. I've got a separate dish here and I always, if I want to mix up a large amount of paint, often in these small palettes there isn't enough room and you'll find that the wells overspill and then all your paints get messy so nice to just grab a little dish. Um, people keep asking me where I get these ceramic dishes from. I, I just pick them up in, in places you know like kitchenware shops and things like that so um, I'm going to Ikea shortly actually I just moved house so uh, it's, uh, it's time for a trip to Ikea. I had a lot of built-in studio um, shelves and things in the last house and I have none here so my stuff's literally lying around the floor in boxes, um, but we're going to get it all sorted out. I think some IKEA Billy bookcases will be coming home to the studio. If I were just to put this paint on as it sat like this, if it overlapped any yellow that there wasn't wax on, it would go green. I don't really want green in this uh, in this particular sea, so I'm going to put some pink in it. The pink I've got here, the permanent rose, it tends to be a very strong colour, so do be careful. You know there is a chance of it just going um, far too purple. There we are, that's not looking bad. If I apply it and find it's too blue, I can always add a little bit more pink as we go along. And we're going to apply it now to the water area. Now, I'm going to wet the lower edge only. The area I'm going to wet is here where the sea meets the sand. And this bit of sand here is dry. I'm not gonna take the water far enough down that it's gonna mess this up. And I'm not gonna take it up here anywhere we want a crisp edge at the horizon there. So usually you get a crisp edge on the sea unless it's kind of a really misty day. And I've painted landscapes like that before, or seascapes I should say. Now when you take water along like this, there is a chance you get a drying line here where the water stops. So the way to get rid of that is to dry your brush and really sweep that out so you're getting almost a sort of semi-dry edge to the water there. And now I'm going to be going in and because I want that to be um, hitting wet there, I'm just going to go in straight away at the lower edge here, and then I'm gonna go up. So if you're wetting an edge like that to get some softness, you really want to um, make sure that you paint on it quickly and that you don't go um, off the edge of the water. So it's worth going out quite a bit wider. It's going green here, so I'm gonna get a little bit of uh, 
of more pink in here and just start spreading. It may seem quite scary if you're a beginner to put colours straight onto the paper like that. If you chuck yellow on your paper, for instance, and then you chuck blue on top, green will happen, you know, um, it has to. It's, there's, uh, there's no way it can't. So I'm going a little bluer here. And I think, actually, just for added drama, I think we're going to go a little bit pinker up here by the horizon. I'm going to be very careful here to paint quite neatly. If you have trouble with your hand shaking, Try resting your um, your hand, your wrist on the uh, on the paper, or you can support it like this. So there we are. I think just for a bit of added drama, I'm going to go straight in here for a little bit of pink in that middle section there. I don't want to work on this too long. I'm actually really happy with that. Next up, we're going to paint some rocks. Now it's really important that your sand is dry at this point, otherwise your rocks will bleed and get soft edges on. And soft edges and rocks are not really a thing, as we all know. So we want those rocks to be nice and hard edged. So that means we have to paint on bone dry paper. And I'll be showing you how to mix the color so that it's just a, a nice, deep, dark, neutral. So my beach is dry again now, and um, I'm gonna paint some rocks. I want a really dark color. so. What I am doing is, uh, is going in with the yellow and the Payne's Grey. As I said, because of the amount of blue pigment in Payne's Grey, this mix can go slightly greenish. So in order to get rid of that, we're just going to knock it out with a touch of pink. Now, if at the beginning, when you chose your colours as your staining colour, you chose a sepia, then you wouldn't have to make this mix. You can just go straight in with that brown. Once I've got a dark colour that I'm satisfied with, I'm going to change to a smaller brush and then I'm going to start painting. So I want these rocks to be hard edged, which is why we're going on to dry paper. But they can just look a little bit sort of flat and unnatural. So one thing that's quite fun to do is just to get a piece of tissue paper, you know, really scrunched up and just to blot in places. And you can even sort of drop extra paint on top. I'll show you with a larger one at the front so you can see the process more easily. And so we'll go in here and see our rocks looking a bit flat there. So we're just going to get some little marks going on and perhaps go in at the base with a bit more wet paint so that we get a bit of uneven drying going on there and it's just a bit more interesting to look at. I can't actually see the original pencil marks at the front here, but we're not going to worry about that. I'm just going to put some rock shapes on. Remembering to keep them flat at the base and a little bit wider than they are tall, and this will help them to lie flat in the landscape. So remember how we plan to get those little rocks a little bit smaller as they were going into the distance. Don't be afraid at this point, if you think it needs more than you've drawn, to add more in. So I'm going to get on, put a few more rocks in and then let them dry. So we're into the final stages of the painting now and we're going to do two things. We're going to remove the masking fluid or the mask that you put on the sun so that we have a nice bright white sun in that sky. The other thing we're going to do is a stage that I go through with all of my paintings and that's just to look around the painting and see if there's enough tonal contrast everywhere. Now this is a time when beginners are often tempted to reach for a pen because you know one area is not showing up against another area. Let's grab a pen and outline it. Well it's much better actually to leave the pen to one side and to increase tonal contrast. So that's what we're going to look at doing for the final stage of our painting to give it all of that drama and that beauty that you get in a nice watercolour painting. So we're nearly at the end of this simple landscape painting and what I want to do now is just have a look overall and see if there's anywhere that I think needs more tonal contrast. Now to me I think we could get a bit more tonal contrast in the other uh, sky. We've got a white sun here remember it's only going to show up if there are darks around it. Of course there is some yellow around it but I think it's dried a bit lighter than I want. I also want a bit more dark up in the sky here. Now this is not a necessary step for everybody. You may look at yours and think that, well, the sky dried really dark, but the sea's a bit too light. So I'm not saying that everyone at this point has to adjust their sky. I'm saying that this is the point where you look around your painting and see if any of it needs to be a bit stronger. And for me, that is the sky. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm just going to repeat the process I did earlier. The only thing I'm going to be careful of is that I'm not going to take the water down and touch the sea here because strong colours, particularly those with red in, tend to run. So I want to be careful of doing that. So I'm going to apply clean water from the horizon here, just above the water and up. 
and uh, rather than go down, I don't want to drag any of this blue into the yellow, I'm going to go upwards. So I'm just stopping just before that line of water there, just before that line of sea. So just re-wetting the sky and then I'm going to change back to my round brush. So I want to get some more colour around that sun, so I'm going to go in with some yellow. I'm going to be really careful that this paint's dry, so I'm getting rid of some of that water just off camera on a piece of tissue there. And we're going to put some more of that in there. Because masked areas only show up when they've got dark around them. And I think actually, I don't want it too pink here, but I'm just going to go in with the tiniest bit of pink there as well. And of course it will go to a nice sunset orange as it hits that area there. Getting a bit of drying line at the bottom there, so I'm going to clean my brush, dry it so it's damp and just sweep that out there so that we get that nice blended effect. I'm going to go back in with some darker paint here and again a little bit of the pink. So sweeping across there. have to work really quickly at this point because there's a chance that it can start drying and you see as it starts to dry you'll get more noticeable streaks and drying lines. So I'm just going to get a little bit more pink in the sky at the top here. If you can hear any strange noises it's just started to hammer down with rain outside. The delights of England. And now I'm going to let that dry before my final step which is to take off the masking fluid. So again really important that your work is dry before you take this masking fluid off. You can take it off with your fingers by rubbing in a small circle or you can do what I prefer to do, which is to use an eraser and to lift it like that. Either way, you never want to be pulling it um, directly upwards like this. Anything like tape or masking fluid, pull it off at a low angle and very slowly and carefully, otherwise there's a risk of tearing your paper. So look at that beautiful effect. And I've got a few little bits of pencil here and there, um, possibly in the foreground as well. As long as you're sure your paint's completely dry, you can Take a little eraser across like this and just clean up any areas where you've got a few pencil marks. So that's all cleaned up nicely. Really happy with the effects there, especially the way all of the colours relate to each other. So do let me know in the comments if you're going to have a go at this tutorial and uh, what you found useful about it. Now if you'd like to chat with other artists do pop along to my Facebook group. It's a lovely, friendly, supportive place. I don't allow any nonsense in there. We don't have anybody talking about politics or religion or any of that stuff. It's just all about art and all about improvement and all about supporting each other. You'll find the link in the description of this video. Now if you're fairly new to watercolour painting, you'd like a little bit more help, you might enjoy my tutorial that I did recently on watercolour do's and don'ts. I'll link to that video right now.